Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Critical Issues Forum online teachers workshop. So today we are going to start our first lecture by Dr. Ferenc Daronkiveres. So as you know, today's uh, uh, this year's topic is nuclear risk reduction, crisis prevention in a time of international turbulence. So it is very important to understand the scientific aspects of nuclear weapons. And I am very happy to introduce Dr. Ferenc Darnokiveres. Ferenc is, needless to say, now an essential part of the Critical Issues Forum. So I am so thankful to his support for this program. So let me introduce uh, Dr. Ferenc Darnokiveres uh, briefly. He's a scientist in residence and adjunct professor at the Center for Nonproliferation Studies and at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. Dr. Ferenc Darnokiveres is, um, uh, he holds a Master's of Science and a PhD in High Energy Physics from Carleton University, Canada. He specialized in ultra low radioactivity background detectors and has professional experience in the field of astroparticle physics, primarily neutrino physics. He has been involved in several major discoveries in the field of neutrino physics and has worked on several international collaborations in Canada, Germany, Italy, and the United States, including the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. He was a member of the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory collaboration that won the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics. He's also a laureate, along with his team of the 2016 Breakthrough Prize in Physics. He has contributed to more than 40 articles in academic journals. Dr. Darunakiveres recognizes that knowledge of science is crucial for understanding weapons of mass destruction and the security threat they pose. He has spearheaded several initiatives to promote science education at Midgerberry Institute, including a course entitled Science and Technology for Weapons of Mass Destruction, a, a requirement for all incoming nonproliferation and terrorism students. So now we are so excited to have uh, uh, Dr. De uh, Ferenc Darnokiveres for this year's uh, CIF Online Teachers Workshop. So now I'm going to give you a microphone to Ferenc. Thank you very much for the uh, nice introduction. Um, it's my pleasure always to, to be part of the CIF um, and, um, and especially also to address my uh, fellow instructors and teachers um, it's, it's really always my, uh, my, my pleasure. So, um, let's see here. So we'll start with um, just kind of a basic introduction um, to nuclear weapons. And then the next slide will focus, uh, our next presentation will focus more uh, on nuclear weapon effects. So first, let's, let's start at the beginning and talk about the fission process um, we're going to talk about critical mass and nuclear weapon design, uh, the two main types of um, nuclear weapons that are often referenced, which is the gun type and the implosion type nuclear weapon. And then we'll, we'll go into some, some of the consequences um, of nuclear weapons. And then we'll also talk about um, much more advanced uh, uh, nuclear weapons as well. So this just gives kind of the uh, modern view um, of, of the carbon atom. Right. This is what you're familiar with. Um, and you've probably seen this before in, in chemistry and many other places. So the idea is if you look at the carbon atom, um, it's made out of six protons and six neutrons. And it's kind of, you have this very hard, um, dense center. 1% of the time you can actually find a carbon 13 atom, um, which is actually an isotope of carbon. Uh, and it has seven neutrons and six protons. So it's one more neutron, but at same number of protons. Um, we call this isotopes with six protons and six neutrons, we call this an isotope, we call it carbon 12. 
And you can think of it as a very kind of hard, dense center, and around it is the electron cloud with, with um, six electro electrons. It's kind of much less dense. Now, carbon-12 and carbon-13 are both isotopes of carbon, and I'll, I'll talk about that um, uh, soon uh, later on. Um, they chemically behave like carbon, but the interesting thing is that isotopes of an element behave very differently in um, nuclear react, uh, react, reactions. So a chemical, this is kind of the elements versus isotopes, a chemical element is one type of atom distinguished by the number of protons it has in the nucleus, we call this an atomic number. They combine into molecules which have very specific chemical properties. Water, as you know, is H2O, uh, has two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen and something like trinitrotoluene or TNT has a, is a, you know, a well-known explosive, has a much more complicated formula with carbons and hydrogens and nitrogen and oxygen. Now an isotope is an element has the same number of protons as the element, but differs in the number of neutrons. So just like earlier we saw carbon-12 and uh, carbon-13, the difference was that uh, carbon-12 has six protons and six neutrons, and carbon-13 has six protons, but instead of having six neutrons, it now has seven neutrons. Now, if you think about chemical reactions, it corresponds to certain energy, but let's say E here. But nuclear reactions can lead to much, much, much more energy. That's why I drew a very big E. Now, you can kind of think of isotopes are like types of milk. Well, you know, if you have milk, you have uh, skim milk, you have 2% uh, milk and, and all that. Um, but in the end, it's still just milk. The same is true with uh, hydrogen. Hydrogen has an isotope, which is H1, which is hydrogen. But you can have deuterium, where you have a proton and one neutron. And you can have tritium, which is uh, one proton, because that's what tags the, the element, uh, but has two neutrons. In the end, it's all just really still just hydrogen. So at the chemical level, um, it's just hydrogen. It'll just behave chemically exactly the same. But at the nuclear level, it'll have very, very different nuclear properties. So a deuterium and tritium, for example, have very, very different uh, nuclear properties. And these isotopes also tend to be radioactive. And we'll, we'll talk about it in much more, much more detail. Now, when something is radioactive, it describes the property that some isotopes will, over time, change to another isotope. So it changes from one isotope into another isotope. In the process, when it does that, it gives off a little bundle of energy. These are particles that, like, um, like alpha particles, which are helium nuclei, beta particles, which are fast electrons. These just kind of shoot out from the isotope as it decays from one type to another. And it's constantly looking for a more stable form. Now, the important thing to remember that those little particles that come out, those little bundles of energies, um, they shoot out like bullets. And that is actually what does the damage um, from radioactive materials. We'll talk about that in, in more detail as we go a little later on. Now, cesium-137 is one metal. You see that on the left, left panel. Over time, it will decay to another completely different metal, but barium-137. They look also completely different. It's kind of amazing that this just happens um, through the decay process, through, through time. Uh, it doesn't disappear. It just changes from one type of metal to another type of metal. Now, keep in mind the idea of energy being carried by these particles. The more energy you have in the particle itself, the more damage you can do. Just like if you have a bigger bullet, the more damage you can do. The more bullets you have, also the more damage you can do as a whole. So all of these things are, um, are important. When these bullets essentially hit the, these particles or these bullets hit the body or hit different, different objects, it basically transfers that energy, it deposits energy, and that's really the damage that, um, that these particles can do. Now, nuclear reactors or weapons use a special class of isotopes that exhibit a property called fission, and that's what I want to um, focus on. Um, now, not all elements have this property. It's really the ones that are at the bottom, that are at the bottom um, of the periodic table, which you can kind of see here. Now, the element uranium, 
has two isotopes, uranium-235. And these are ones I really want you to kind of focus on, uranium-235 and uranium-238. And the interesting thing is that because it's the same element, it has the same number of protons. So um, all uranium isotopes have 92 protons. That's what I show here, 92 protons. Um, and the rest is going to be because the 235 actually labels the, the amount of protons plus the number of neutrons. So you have 142 neutrons plus 92 protons because 142 plus 92 is the number 235. And then for U238, you have ni still 92, prot 92 protons, but then you have a different number of uh, a, a few more, three more neutrons, 145 neutrons. And the interesting thing is, even though there's only a few neutrons difference, they still behave completely differently. So uranium-235 and uranium-238 will, will behave differently. If you look in nature, what you'll find is, and it doesn't matter what you look at, for example, you could, you could look at water uh, and, and analyze it, and you'll find in, uh, find in water a little bit of uranium. If you analyze it, you'll find that basically most of it, 99.3%, is all uranium-238 isotope. But there's a small 0.7% of uranium-235. And this is the material that's actually useful for, for nuclear weapons. The other element to keep in mind is plutonium. And I'm sure you've heard of that before. Um, plutonium-239 is an isotope uh, 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 which is produced in reactors. So it's not produced it's not coming from the ground as you would have uranium, you, you actually mine uranium, but it's actually produced um, in reactors. But there are also other isotopes like plutonium-240 and plutonium-238 and, and, and many others. But plutonium-238 and uranium-235 are the ones that are very useful for, for nuclear weapons. Now, the chemistry of uh, everything is really everything to do with the atoms, the, the electrons that are bound to the atoms. So that's that soft, dense cloud. And if you think about that, let that energy be rep represented as E equals E chem, basically a small amount. But in the nuclear world, we really focused on the dense center, the nucleus. That's where the protons and the neutrons are. And, um, the energy that binds them together and the energy that's really uh, bound in the nucleus is much, much higher. So here I'm showing a million to 100 million times higher than the energy um, in the chemical world. And you have to remember that the chemical world is everything to do with combustion, everything to do with fire and, and, and everything you're used to, whereas the nuclear world is nuclear reactors and nuclear weapons and, and all that kind of stuff. So there's a vast amount of energy um, in the nucleus. Now, through the fission process, what happens through the fission process is that uranium will split. So here I'm showing a uranium-235 atom. It will split in two or even three pieces. And those, uh, those pieces are left behind. Those are called fission products. We'll talk about those more later on, especially when we talk about nuclear weapon effects. Um, these isotopes tend to be radioactive. So you have, a, and, and through this process, you release a lot of energy. And the energy is in the form of what are called gamma rays, which are very fast, uh, basically light, light particles, um, uh, very high energy light particles. You can have um, electrons, uh, and, and then you also release these two neutrons. Now keep in mind these two neutrons that you release. Now imagine that if you have a U-235 and a neutron comes in here, and this is another important point, is neutron comes in here, starts this reaction, the U-235 splits into two or three pieces, then you release another neutron. Now what would happen if you have another U-235 atom that's nearby? So that that neutron that, that, that initiated this fission process here where you're releasing two other neutrons, now hits U-235, and releases more neutrons. And then this neutron hits another U-235 and so on and so on. And this is the idea of a chain reaction, a chain reaction. So for example, if you have uranium-235 metal or even plutonium-239 metal, what can happen if you have a stray neutron or a neutron, uh, some sort of trigger neutron come in, 
And what can happen is the U-235 will split, will produce two neutrons, and then neutron finds one, uh, finds U-235, then that splits, that gives off two neutrons, and so on and so on. And so what you get is, because through each splitting, you get a great deal of um, energy being released, you get a great multiplication of energies. And you can kind of see this here, in this simple picture of the generations. In the first generation, you only have uh, one neutron. Uh, in the second generation, you have two. And then, of course, if you think of it, that's the number of splittings that you have. So that gets multiplied times the number of energy per splitting. Um, then you have four, then you have eight, then you have 16, then you have 32. And you see that it rapidly, rapidly becomes a very large uh, number. And keep in mind, look at, look at this, the 64 is nine times 10 to the 18, so it's 64 different splittings. But as you get to 82 splittings, it's 2.4 times 10 to the 24 splittings that you're producing. So keep that in mind, that 82nd generation produces this, this many splittings. It's gonna, it becomes important here. <laughs> so, um, the 200 million electron volts that gets uh, released, so uh, an electron volt is a unit of energy. And a million of electron volts is a lot more energy than you have in the chemical world, where you're talking about hundreds of electron volts, not millions of electron volts. So the energy that you get for one fission, energy per fission, is 200 million electron volts. Of course, these are all a very rough number. And that's equivalent to, in the human world, it's really equivalent to 3.2 times 10 to the minus 11. So we're talking about a really, really small number uh, of joules per fission. And if you think about the fact that a knee bend itself, so just bending your knee <laughs> um, is equivalent to 100 joules, then you think, whoa, that's then, then the amount of energy per fission must be a very, very small amount compared to a knee bend. And yes, that's true. But the fact is you have so many fissions happening in 882 generation. Remember that 2.4 times 10 to the 24 fissions. You have so many of them that if you multiply these numbers, the 2.4 times 10 to the 24 fissions times 3.2 times 10 to the minus 11 joule per fission, what you get is a very large number of joules, which is equivalent to um, 18.3 kilotons TNT. That is about the amount that the, um, unfortunately, the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. So this gives you a sense, and if you think about this, um, and this has to do with Avogadro's number, um, which I don't really wanna, wanna go into too much detail, but you, you may remember that the, um, there's something called the mole. And if you have a mole, then you have, then 235 grams of uranium-235 is equivalent to six times 10 to the 23 uh, atoms that would have been split. If you, if you take that into account, you find that the amount of uranium that is actually split is only equivalent to one kilogram. In other words, 18.3 kilotons of TNT is equivalent to one kilogram of uranium-235 being split. So, that's what I mean by there's a large amount of energy um, in the nucleus and you really can't blame people for wanting to try to find ways to access all that energy. But let's keep in mind how big 18.3 kilotons TNT is. If you think about what a ton of TNT is, it would mean a thousand kilograms of TNT. But we're talking about a kiloton of TNT, not one ton of TNT, a kiloton of TNT. So it's a thousand times a thousand kilograms, a million kilograms of TNT. These are very, very large explosions. And this is what I call um, the nuclear difference. So on the left side, I'm showing one kilogram of TNT exploding, which you can see is a pretty small explosion. And on the right side, I'm showing one kilogram of U-235 essentially being uh, used up um, through the fission process, um, yielding an 18 kilotons TNT explosion. It's dramatic, the amount of energy that's in the nucleus. And it's unfortunate that people use it to make, to make nuclear weapons. 
A kind of useful analogy to all this, the way you can kind of think about this um, is in terms of mousetraps. If you have a mousetrap, let, let's assume that you have a mousetrap like this and you have two ping pong balls on top and you can certainly try this at home. Um, and then you have a uh, mousetrap set by, set by side so that the ping pong balls uh, represent the neutrons. So you set all these mousetraps together like this in a row and then have many rows like this. And then what you do is you, uh, you, let, you, you take another ping pong ball, ball and just like the incoming neutron, you trigger one of the mousetraps to be let go. Then what happens is the, uh, the ping pong balls, if it's confined, the ping pong balls will jump around and hit another one and that will go off. And that's basically very similar to how it works for the, um, uh, uh, through the fission process. So now if you have uranium-235 that's very dense, meaning the U-235s are very close together, that necessarily implies that it has a very high enrichment. So there I'm talking about the amount of U-235 compared to U-238. So that the, so once a, a ping pong ball fires off or a neutron fires off and, 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 and enters the material, then it'll quickly find another um, U-235 atom. So the ping pong balls represent the neutrons and the mousetrap on clamping simulates the fission process. So here I have an example of what um, it would look like. Let's, let's hope that this will work properly. So with this very simple demonstration, and this is essentially how nuclear weapons work, how the fission process works, um, except this is a very, very fast chain reaction. All the energies, and as I'll talk about the nuclear weapon effects, and I'll talk about nuclear explosion in more detail, um, you know, all the energy is dispersed in a very, very um, quick amount of time. Uh, um, in fact, if you think about 82 generations, that's, that's a very short amount of time. Um, in a reactor, you basically do a similar process, but you slow it all down. So a nuclear reactor really can't really explode like a bomb in the same way. So how do you get an extremely fast chain reaction? Well, you have to increase the mass of material so that as little neutrons escape from the chain as possible. So you notice that I had also the plexiglass um, around it so that uh, the neutrons wouldn't escape. So we'd be forcing neutrons to come back. And that's going to become important later on, but this is uh, kind of how it works. So the key to, to nuclear weapons is really managing the neutrons. So you have to make sure that there's enough neutrons to continue the chain reaction, and you have to make sure that no neutrons escape or get absorbed um, through other interactions. And this gets us to the concept uh, of critical mass um, Let's look at this very first diagram on the left. Here we have, a, the, the blue basically represents the amount of material that we have. So in the blue case, what we have is we have one neutron coming in from the right side, um, hitting one of this, these little stars uh, represent uh, one fission process, releasing in this case, uh, three neutrons, these find another, uh, find another atom, this splits. But what you find is that the, the black arrows, there's more of them escaping then kind of go back randomly into the material. And so you don't really sustain a chain reaction. The fission reaction really stops even after the, first, after the second generation. But now see what happens when we increase the amount of material. This is the idea of a critical mass. So enough material so that on average, uh, more neutrons are produced than escape. You still have a lot of neutrons that tend to escape, but you have a lot, of, a lot of neutrons that also go backward into material and find uh, uh, more U-235s, for example, to fission. And so you can sustain the chain reaction. So the fission is self-sustaining. Now imagine if you have much more material, 
then it gets to be very, very fast. Uh, supercritical uh, material, it, gets, it, goes, it happens very, very fast. Now, if you look on the, very, on the third one, uh, the, the, the very right uh, diagram, what you can see is you can see a reflector around, and this they usually think of as being beryllium, which is a metal, which, ref which basically reflects the neutrons back in. So instead of losing it, just like the plexiglass, you confine it and you, um, <clears throat> you have them reflect back into the, the, uh, the, the material itself. And so where before you had, <clears throat> on, the, on the very left side, um, you had the efficient stop after just the second generation. In this case, because you're reflecting them back in, you can still sustain the chain reaction. So the critical mass really depends on the configuration that you have and, and how you design it. But you can see that the more material you have, the higher, uh, you know, the easier it is to sustain the chain reaction. <clears throat> Now, when we think about uh, nuclear weapons, we really think about two types of nuclear weapons. One type is called the gun type uh, nuclear weapon. So this is the type of nuclear weapon that was uh, unfortunately dropped on Hiroshima. <coughs> and the other on the left side, I'm showing the implosion type nuclear weapon, um, which was uh, unfortunately dropped on uh, Nagasaki. So in the case of the gun type design, this is the simplest design. Basically what you're doing is you're taking two halves close to critical mass. It actually tends to be more than one half critical mass and you slam them together very quickly. And that's why they call it a gun type design. You slam one side into the other to basically assemble a critical mass. In the case of the implosion type weapon, it's a different design. In this case, you would, and there's many different types of the design, but in this case, you kind of have a spherical shell, which I show in blue, and you use explosives to explode it, but it, it doesn't only explode outward, it also implodes inward. And so through that implosion process, you compress that sphere of spherical shell um, of uranium-235 into a compressed ball, and you also reach a critical mass. So these are two ways um, that, that you, that, um, people use to, uh, to you know, have nuclear weapons. One type is the gun type design and the other is the implosion type design. But the idea is just to assemble critical mass. So you can increase the chance um, of a neutron hitting the nucleus and so on. So here you see a better kind of a different picture of it. This is the kind of the design here where you have a uh, uranium bullet being shot into a, a uranium cylinder and it slams together. Once it comes together, um, it forms um, a, a critical mass. The way I always kind of think about this is kind of like two halves of the material. If I, if I have, on the, on the right side, you can see these two different panels. Um, in the one side, I have one half critical mass and at the, at the bottom part of another half critical mass. If I, uh, um, send a neutron through it, through the material, I have a much higher chance of hitting one of the atoms when I have a larger uh, room in this case, as I'm showing, uh, than if it was just half a, a critical mass. Oops, I'm sorry. Now, the important thing with the gun type design is that uh, testing is not necessary for it. So you don't need to test a gun type design. And that's why we're concerned that uh, non-state actors or terrorists, if they would ever be able to get a hold of uh, what's called fissile material or uranium-235, um, then it would not be hard for them uh, to make a bomb. This is a famous uh, uh, physicist, Louis Alvarez, who said um, even a high school kid could make a bomb um, in short order. Now, this is a type of weapon that was uh, dropped on the Japanese city of Hiroshima, and I'll, I'll talk about that later, later um, with an, a horrible uh, effect. And, and you have to remember that this was a small bomb compared to um, bombs that are now um, uh, in, uh, that the United States has and other countries have. Now, the disadvantage of a gun type weapon is it's not very safe. Um, two pieces that are subcritical, but if inadvertently combined, it could potentially cause an explosion. It's also not very efficient. Um, 
it didn't have a very very high yield. If you think about it, the uh, Hiroshima bomb was basically, uh, I think it was 64 kilograms of uh, uranium, uh, and only one kilogram of that actually was turned into, uh, into energy uh, that did all the devastating effect. So it's not a very efficient use uh, of fissile material either. But we think of this as a weapon of choice um, for non-state actors. Now, a plutonium-239 material. So the two materials you have to kind of think about is uranium-235 and plutonium-239. Plutonium-239 will not work in a gun-type design because it, uh, it basically produces too many neutrons. And if it produces too many neutrons, then as the two pieces would come together, it would disassemble itself and it, it just wouldn't produce a very large um, explosion. So instead, with a implosion type design, you saw the picture before that I had, you see in the right panel here, you have a kind of uh, um, square with all these little, little dots which represent the uh, U-235s. If you compress that, they come closer together. And so if you send a neutron to that, you have a much higher chance that, the, um, that they'll hit one of them and you, and you can sustain the chain reaction. And that's the idea with an implosion type weapon. Instead of taking two pieces that come together, what you do is you compress it. So you're pushing all those atoms closer together. So if one of them fissions and neutron goes off, it'll find another atom and, and it, it will um, sustain the chain reaction. Um, it's a much more complicated design and we, we generally think that only nation states are uh, capable of it rather than um, non-state actors. Um, now, the difference from a gun type design is that with an implosion type design, you actually need to test it. Um, and to do that, you would actually have to, uh, you'd have to explode it and, and we have this comprehensive test band 3D, um, which, is, which is able to detect it. And I think I talk about it a little later. In the process of uh, having a nuclear weapon go off, through the fission process, as I described earlier, you're releasing all these very dangerous radioactive materials and some very long-lived contaminants and isotopes like cesium-137 and strontium-90. These are the materials that, that ha they have a 30-year half-life, so they tend to stay around for a very long time, and they produce these radioactive bullets that I'm going to be talking about in more detail in the next lecture. Uh, now, when you look at U-235 and plutonium-239, it splits asymmetrically and def not necessarily symmetrically. So the picture you might have is that you take the U-235 and then it splits it kind of in two halves, um, but it's not necessarily one half. It can be any, any way that you can split, um, you know, 92 protons plus uh, 143 neutrons. So um, you could produce strontium-90 or you could produce something like uh, cesium-137. And both are, are, are horrible uh, materials. So for example, with strontium-90, uh, the body mistakes it for calcium and it deposits in the bone. And in the case of cesium-137, uh, the body mistakes it for potassium, which is required in, uh, for all living things. So um, it, in, it can produce cancer and, and um, uh, do dev devastating effect on, on humans. Um, and, and there's many, many isotopes that are produced. So here what I'm showing is the, uh, this is a reactor, it's not a bomb, but it shows you how long these isotopes tend to stay around. So here I'm talking about time, right? Here I'm talking about uh, 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years, and you see that the effect or the radioactivity, it really means the effect of these bullets uh, tends to stay around for a very long time. Now, modern nuclear weapons are a little different from the ones that I just discussed. And it's based on the idea of uh, fusion. Now, instead of splitting process where you split a U-235 into two pieces, you can take light isotopes like deuterium and tritium, the two isotopes of hydrogen that I talked about earlier, and you can combine them as long as you can, can overcome the repulsive force that they have. And through this process, you can, you can produce fusion energy.
And this is used in um, some types of uh, uh, nuclear weapons, in the modern nuclear weapons, let's say. The first is called the boosted nuclear weapons. And in this case, we don't really think of this as a, uh, as a hydrogen bomb or as a fusion bomb or anything like this. The idea is that through the implosion process, as this, um, as this bomb compresses the uh, fissile material, you produce a very high temperature and pressure. And it's a high enough temperature that you can, uh, if you inject deuterium and tritium into the center, into the core of, of this bomb, um, that, the, that the tritium and deuterium will fuse and produce neutrons through this process. So a T plus D will produce an, what's called an alpha particle, which is a, basically just a helium nucleus and a neutron with uh, you know, quite, a, quite a lot of an energetic neutron. Um, and so what you do is, remember I said the neutrons are critical to this process. What you're doing is you're, you're as this is starting to, basically the bomb is starting to implode and then explode, um, you released a burst of neutrons. So this basically catches the uh, pieces of fissile material as it's exploding. So it increases the efficiency um, of the bomb. So the efficiency of, of fission and therefore also increases the yield of the weapon. So this is the first modification uh, to the implosion type design to, um, to, to produce a much higher yield, uh, a yield weapon. Now, uh, modern weapons, and we, we talk about uh, two-stage weapons, use another technique, and that is they actually use uh, a fusion stage. So the idea is that you have what's called a primary and a secondary, and a primary is the, is the fission weapon itself. So this could also have the boosted component, but it's really the fission weapon itself. And then the second secondary is another uh, is basically the fusion weapon, which is a little bit uh, aside. There's a, there's a space difference between the primary and the secondary. And what happens is, and this is through what's called the Teller-Ulam mechanism, what happens is that through the fission process, as the primary is starting to explode, it transfers heat to the secondary. And it does this in a way that the secondary tends to compress, it gets heated, and it gets to such a high temperature that you're turning on essentially the fusion engine um, in the secondary. Um, and um, so in, in this process, you again produce a lot of neutrons. And then, then for example, if you place uh, fissionable material um, around it, you produce even more neutrons and even more energies released. So that's the idea of the hydrogen bomb and, and you know, two stage uh, two-stage weapons. So in two-stage weapons, you have much higher yields. You're talking about megaton yields. So again, let's go through this again. So you have one kilogram and then you have a ton. So you imagine one kilogram of TNT that was the left side of that nuclear difference um, explosion that I was showing. Now imagine a thousand kilograms and that's one ton. Now imagine a thousand tons, so that's one kiloton. So this is a much larger explosion. Now imagine even thousand times more, and that's a megaton. So here through this process and through these modern weapons, you can produce very, very high yield um, explosions. So amazingly, um, a several hundred kilogram bomb has the explosive power of something like, you know, as I was saying, 1000 million uh, kilograms of TNT, very, very large explosions. Okay, um, so the nuclear weapon types that you kind of have to, have to know about is that there's a pure, a pure fission design. This is a gun type, an implosion type design. And then you can have a boosted design where you, have, you insert a small amount of deuterium tritium gas to start up this, um, this reaction. We don't consider this really a fusion bomb. We just, we just basically inc increases the uh, efficiency of the fission bomb itself. And then you can have modern weapons which use the implosion weapon as a trigger for the fusion stage. There's an enormous amount of energy released. Um, if you think of 40 megatons uh, is equivalent to one, one second of energy of the sun on earth in one second. That's just, a, it's a phenomenal amount of energy that can be, uh, can be released in these bombs. And it can also cause enormous, enormous damage. So um, there have been many 
nuclear tests performed over the years. Um, there, um, and, and this video kind of shows you, runs you through the different tests that have happened. They've happened through the 1950s, through the 1960s. Um, there was a moratorium on, on, on uh, tests that were conducted above ground, because if you can imagine, if tests were conducted above ground, and I have a slide, we'll go to the next slide quickly. Um, if tests were conducted above ground, uh, then you produce a lot of these radioactive uh, fallout and, and contaminants, um, just travel in the air and get deposited uh, in, in different locations, and it's very radioactive and very dangerous. Um, and then in the 1960s, uh, you know, there was the Partial Test Ban Treaty, 1963, and so tests were, uh, were then conducted underground, uh, mostly. And now tests are basically all conducted underground because the environmental effect um, of these bombs are so, so horrible. But this to show you um, kind of a short video um, done by uh, Isaiah Hashimoto, a Japanese artist, who kind of shows a time lapse of, of the different nuclear tests that have been conducted. And you can see the, uh, the number of tests and the months and the year and the country that's, that's conducting the tests. So I, I will show this, uh, this, is, this is a fast version of the video. I will just show this briefly. Oops, I'm sorry. So these were the first tests in the Pacific. So you can see it's 1949 in the, in the time. You can see the Soviet Union started testing. these tests that have been conducted at this stage are mostly atmospheric tests. So these release uh, all kinds of harmful um, isotopes into the environment. Okay, so this is just give, to give you a sense at um, how many tests have been conducted? How crazy this was really over, over the years. These were the French. So again, to just zoom it up a bit. India and China. I think you get the picture. Um, a lot of tests have been conducted. And, but basically, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, it's not in force yet. So this is a treaty to ban all uh, nuclear testing, whether it's underground or anywhere, in space, uh, on the surface. Um, all, all nuclear testing is, uh, would be banned. But the treaty is not in force. But there is basically at least a uh, moratorium, general moratorium of testing. Nobody's doing any testing anymore, um, except North Korea um, in the last while, unfortunately. 
So through the years, you can see that there's been a kind of uh, rush here with all this nuclear testing. Um, that's to make, to, to improve the design of the weapons, um, to make them safer in the sense that they won't just simply explode uh, when they don't expect it. Um, also to make them lighter so that they'll fit on uh, missiles and so they can be easier delivered. Um, but there have been terrible accidents um, and so on. And I'll, I'll discuss a little bit of that um, a little later on. Whoops. Now we don't really need uh, uh, nuclear testing anymore. Here are two quotes from uh, uh, people who know. Here's Bruce Goodwin, who's a principal associate director for weapons at uh, Livermore National Laboratory. We have a more fundamental understanding of how these weapons work today than we ever imagined when we were blowing them up. And here's a quote from the, uh, the head administrator from the National Nuclear Security Administration um, that is responsible for uh, nuclear weapons. As we know more about the, uh, the complex issues of nuclear weapons performance today than we ever did during the period of nuclear testing. So um, let's hope that the, that the kind of um, moratorium on uh, nuclear weapon testing uh, will, uh, will remain. Uh, and let's hope that North Korea doesn't do any more uh, nuclear testing. Let's talk a little bit about safety. This is a rare picture of a nuclear weapon that's been completely dismantled. This was a B-61, and you can see all the different components, the things that, it, that, are, that it's made out of. Lots of toxic materials, lots of um, you know, many, many, many different uh, things. There's 3,000 different parts uh, to, to one of these weapons. So there's lots of different pieces to them. Many things can go wrong, unfortunately. Um, now, the warheads themselves contain safety and control devices to prevent unauthorized use of nuclear weapons. So, of course, there's codes. So, for example, uh, to try to prevent unauthorized activation of a nuclear weapon, the President or the Secretary of State uh, and, and the President Secretary of State um, decide on uh, give the order for a nuclear weapon to be launched, um, to be initiated. Uh, they have to provide a dual code. Uh, there's, there's always a dual man rule. So there's always, uh, um, you know, the idea that you always see, and I think I have a slide of this, um, where you have uh, basically two keys that have to unlock, uh, unlock it so that the system so that um, a, a nuclear weapon can be released. Um, and then the device is armed and it would be a unique signal that would be, have to be generated. You can kind of show that here, the arming and the firing voltages. So these have to be kind of a unique signal that has to pass through, has to be authorized to pass through a switch. If it's not authorized, then the weapon won't arm. So this whole part here in the kind of the blue box that I'm showing um, shows you the different steps for having, for being authorized to launch a nuclear weapon. But that's not all that we need also need to prevent accidental activation of a nuclear weapon. So for example, you don't want the nuclear weapon to detonate if there's a fire or it's crushed or there's lightning or it crashes or you know, the airplane that has a nuclear weapon crashes and, and so on. So there has to be some way um, of isolating the system to make sure that uh, even so that, that because of that there's no uh, accidental activation um, of the nuclear weapon, so it can't uh, detonate and it can't arm. So the only way it should arm is if an authorized uh, activation signal has been given. And that's the idea. Um, now, there have been many cases where, and, and I don't, I'm not going to show a list of them, many cases where, where there were accidents where um, uh, airplanes that were carrying nuclear weapons, bombers that were carrying nuclear weapons crashed, uh, and, and thankfully none of the bombs uh, ever detonated, but there have been tens of, there have been dozens of cases where such incidents have happened. Uh, I want to highlight, highlight one accident, which was in 1961, which was the Goldsboro, uh, North Carolina instance. This is just one of them. There, there are many accidents like this, where a B-52 bomber was carrying a, 
uh, Mark II, Mark 39 nuclear weapons, and the bomber itself crashed in uh, North Carolina. <clears throat> when the bomb was flying, they were doing an exercise where they were flying the bomber, uh, and uh, someone noticed on the plane that it was leaking fuel. Um, but the people in charge uh, suggested that the, that the bomber holds its position. And the leak got worse, and over time, um, it, it, had to, it had to carry, had to do an emergency landing. Uh, and as it tried to do that, the, uh, it, as it went through the descent, it lost control of the airplane. The crew tried to eject from the airplane. Remember, it's got two nuclear weapons on board. Uh, the crew tried to eject from the airplane. Um, there were eight people on board. Uh, five people survived. They parachuted down to the ground, ground um, but three, three people died. Two megaton hydrogen bombs were released. I think there were something like three to four megaton bombs. So these, these were, were massive bombs. One of the bombs plunged deep underground, which is still about six meters or 20 foot uh, beneath the ground. Um, and the second bomb, and this is still very controversial, the parachute actually deployed, which means that it must have gone to some part of the arming uh, stage. So it bypassed the arming, the, the authorized activation in this case. One expert said that just for this incident alone, one person said, an expert in this, in this said that one simple dynamo tech low voltage switch stood between the United States and a very major catastrophe. So these incidents, of course, this was a very old, a long time ago, this happened in 1961 and, and, and definitely um, people have learned how to deal with nuclear weapons. Um, but there are all kinds of problems with uh, delivery systems where things can go wrong because they're very complex and with training and, and all kinds of other aspects. So there have been many um, incidents uh, when it comes to uh, nuclear weapons. So there's a, there's a high risk there. Um, there's further safety measures are such things like uh, insensitive high explosives, which, which quite obviously is very important. So um, the explosives that you use to detonate nuclear weapons, so to cause the implosion to happen, you have to make sure that they can be, that they're very resistant to mechanical shock or very, very, and very resistant to fire. Um, fire resistant pits, that means that the plutonium itself or the uranium shells themselves in implosion type design uh, won't disperse the materials in case of a fire. So it won't disperse the, the, the radioactive contaminants and, and just the toxic plutonium and the different metals uh, in, a, in a fire. And what they also have is limited retry. In other words, if you punch in the um, authorized uh, authorization code, and just like in an ATM, um, if you do that to, or a cell phone, you do that too many times, the cell phone will lock you out. So if you do that too many times, then, uh, then you're, you're locked out. And also, if, self, if, if tampering is detected and the system is, uh, if there's some tampering that's detected through the process of authorizing or trying to get a nuclear weapon to detonate, uh, then the system will damage itself um, so that it can't detonate. So there are other safety measures that there are, but, but many of these things can be um, circumvented. And here I give you an example here. Um, uh, for the uh, example, the Minuteman three launch codes in 1960s, the Strategic Air Command or the SAC was far less concerned about unauthorized launches um, of the weapons uh, than about the possibility that they just simply couldn't launch the missiles. So they set all the codes to nine zeros. So everybody knew the launch codes. In other words, the authorization of the launch codes, they basically uh, uh, circumvented this whole blue box here, so that if, if, they, if it was authorized, you know, basically everybody knew the codes. Um, this is still very controversial, but there are, uh, <laughs> but there are many reports um, about this. So they set all the codes to nine zeros, just like on a cell phone, you would never do that as your password. So in my opinion, uh, talking about say the best plan is, uh, is abstinence, um, but you have to make, make up your own mind about that. <clears throat>
So this is a summary. Uh, there's vastly more energy from uh, nuclear reactions than chemical reactions. Um, and, uh, and this is really, I want you to, to think of it this way in terms of the chemical world. And the, you know, it has everything to do with electrons. And there we're talking about a much lower energy than the nuclear world, where you're talking about how neutrons and protons are bound in the nucleus and there's a much larger amount of energy involved. Um, critical mass is the mass of fissile material required to sustain the chain reaction. Um, we were in the first use phase, which was the gun type and implosion type uh, bombs that were unfortunately dropped on the two Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And then a period of bigger, better, and safer, where there were nuclear testing, building boosted and multi-stage weapons. And uh, now I hope we're in a reduction phase. Um, let's hope that we keep on reducing the amount of nuclear weapons uh, um, right now. Okay, that's it. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Ferenc. That was a very comprehensive and uh, very interesting lecture. I see, uh, hi Nelly, I see one Russian teacher is participating. <laughs> So I would like to spend a little bit of time for a question and answer session, if uh, there is any. Um, if you have any question, uh, you can unmute your mic or you can also type in chat. And if, yeah, so can you do that? Uh, if uh, uh, you are still thinking, I would like to, uh, have a, some dialogue or a question <laughs> for people, teachers who will be watching this video later. So, thank you, Ferenc. That's what, okay, from Russia. Yeah, I, I still see, but. Okay, huh? okay, I don't know, I still see. Anyway, sorry about that. So, it was really a comprehensive lecture and <coughs> I wanted to go back to one point when you talked about uh, nuclear differences, the, because in your summary you also highlighted the enormous destructive power of nuclear weapons and comparable to other uh, conventional weapons or even other weapons. Uh, even other weapons of mass destruction. But uh, currently, in the context of a recent political environment, especially in the US, there is uh, some discussion to develop uh, more usable, small type of nuclear weapons. So I know you mentioned, but could you please emphasize again why nuclear weapons are so special and why even small nuclear weapons are still nuclear weapons and compared to any other <coughs> weapons, it is very different. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm going to cover that more in the next lecture, but the difference is really, think about it this way, um, with conventional weapons, and those are devastating in their own right, um, if you think about how much yield you have, in other words, how much, uh, uh, how much equivalent TNT you would have from the explosion. If you're talking about something like a megaton of TNT, right? Think about how big that amount would be. Think of, just think of the sheer volume of that, what that would be. If you think about one kilogram of water is one liter of volume like basically like, like milk or something like this. And if suddenly you have a million liters of water or you have a thousand million, a billion liters of water, you have a very, very large, large volume. So that just gives you a sense at how it's so different from conventional um, explosions. Just think of the amount of material that you would need to produce the equivalent amount. But the other difference is it's not just the explosion. It's not just the blast wave that causes the explosion and so on. It's everything else that comes with it, which is all the other effects, the massive fires, the 
um, thermal effect, the radioactivity that's released, all the stuff that I'm going to be talking about in the next, the next case. Now, the United States deciding to build uh, low-yield nuclear weapons is bad in many different ways. First of all, it's kind of um, letting the genie out of the bottle, in some sense, of having a new design of nuclear weapons, um, which generally the United States has not been doing. It has not been this idea that we're going to build new nuclear weapons. Always been kind of, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll just make sure, you have to be careful how I say this, but uh, we just make sure that old weapons work. We wanna make sure they work better. The United States wants to make sure they work better, but not really to build new design nuclear weapons. So it, it's opening up a new page and a, and a very dangerous page for that. Um, and also the, the claim has been that the effect that, that the United States needs them um, because the effect is uh, because they need to, to say destroy targets under, underground or, or something like this and that there's not going to be collateral uh, damage. So there's not going to be civilian casualties or it's going to be very minimal. And, and that's just simply not true. In any case, you look at it, there's always going to be uh, um, um, other effects that are going to happen. It just seems like a very rosy picture about what these terrible weapons could do. Uh, Nelly has a question. Yes, um, that's a very good question, Nelly. Uh, I'm going to cover that in the next lecture, actually, uh, in a little bit of detail. It is very much a real thing. And um, uh, as uh, Mexico has been very uh, closely uh, following the humanitarian uh, conferences and the nuclear test, uh, not sorry, the nuclear weapons ban um, treaty, uh, the, the fact that, there, that a nuclear winter occurs is a very important thing that I'm going to discuss in the next lecture. And it's very much connected to, uh, I think, the seriousness of, the, of why the countries took the um, uh, nuclear weapons ban treaty so, so seriously. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, I am not sure if uh, this um, chat text is going to be recorded. So just for the nearest yeah. question was uh, uh, nuclear, is nuclear winter a real thing? And uh, in, for the sake of recording. So I have a, I just wanted to ask one more question. Then I guess uh, your next session is also related. So if there is any follow-up question, we can continue. But you showed very, very interesting video of the nuclear testing. It's really amazing, fascinating, but so scary to see how much damage might have caused to environment and also human body. Actually, this is going to be also related to the next session, the effect. So maybe I will save that question for the next session. But uh, you said nuclear testing uh, were conducted to improve. One of the reasons why so many nuclear weapons testing were conducted was to improve safety. I think uh, uh, that's also true. But perhaps some people think this is going to be quite controversial statement or well, I'm not sure do you think how the nuclear testing uh, did nuclear testing really contribute to improve the safety of nuclear weapons <laughs> um, I, I think so I mean to to, to uh, test uh, you know whether the test will whether the design will work as they expected um, whether you reach the yield uh, whether it will uh, detonate improperly or it's all those things, you know, they, they need to do, needed to do testing right. for. Um, yeah. And some things can be tested without, you know, uh, speaking from their perspective, some testing tests they could do uh, without detonating the explosions, but other ones they just need to do, do from their point of view, they need to do the, the actual tests. But it's also the idea of, uh, being able to prove that you could get the yield that you could uh, that you expected, 
to get. That was also another reason why they, they wanted to do testing, just to make sure that it worked as they thought it would. And um, you can imagine also in the scenarios where they were trying to think about uh, the whole deterrence issue. If you would find that in a second strike or something in a first strike, you wouldn't be able to, if, if, if a percentage of the weapons wouldn't detonate, then they would consider themselves to be more vulnerable um, compared to the other, to, to compared to the Soviet Union or something like this. So they felt that they had to need to, needed to do more tests. So it's for many reasons that they had, that they had to actually do the testing. Thank you. So this means nuclear testing is essential in order for a country to be a full-fledged nuclear weapon state. Mm, I have to be careful with saying that. Uh, I, I think from f for if they want to have yes, I mean if they if if a country like North Korea if they want to have to have large yield tests uh, bombs that work. Uh, nuclear weapons that, that work, then you need to test it. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And uh, even though no matter how uh, much you would like to improve the safety, as you mentioned, there is always some possibility of uh, accidental use. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and whether it's humans making the mistake um, the example that I gave with setting the codes to zero is, is really an awful example. Um, because humans could be making a mistake or the design is, an, is, is a mistake or, you know, there's, if you look through the, um, all the different uh, accidents that ha that's happened, um, it's, it's really uh, awful. Really dozens of accidents. Right. Thank you. That's very interesting. So, okay, why don't we uh, take a break here? Then uh, we can come back uh, to the second part of your lecture that will focus on the effects of the nuclear the use of nuclear weapons. So I will stop recording here. Okay, thank you.